Good afternoon, I'm Bob Blackwell. I'm the Henry Kissinger Senior Fellow for American Foreign Policy here at the Council. And on behalf of the Council, uh, let me welcome you to this particular uh, event with uh, Admiral Dennis Blair and Lord John Brown on the st strategic consequences of the American oil boom. Uh, the way we'll proceed is uh, we'll have a conversation up here among the three of us for about a half an hour, and then we'll turn it over to you for comments and questions, and we will end promptly at uh, 2 o'clock. So again, thank you for coming on this uh, cold, wintry New York afternoon. Uh, let me start, John, if I could, with you. Uh, we all read about fracking. Uh, I think not all of us are. Uh, technologists in uh, the energy industry. Can you tell us what exactly is it? Well, good afternoon. Fracking uh, was invented, I think, just after the American Civil War uh, by the Colonel Roberts Torpedo Company. Uh, rather a remarkable thing. It wasn't what we do today. It was uh, using explosives to break open rock. Uh, I point this out in a book I've just written called The Seven Elements. And uh, but it was later revived by uh, Amoco. Amoco Corporation, now part of BP, uh, invented a way of forcing sand, high pressure, it can, uh, propelled by water, into rocks that needed space uh, to let the oil and gas that's in them flow out. So it was creating pathways for flow. The big thing that happened that changed everything was when you combined that with something called horizontal drilling, which opened up more of the reservoir, the earth, as it were, underneath, uh, so that when you fracked it, you opened up even more pathways for the oil and gas to flow. And that's what is commonly now called fracking. It's really horizontal drilling with what, what is technical, technically called hydraulic fracking, using water, hydraulic, uh, under high pressure with sand in it to force open the rock. Uh, and that's uh, the state of the art at the moment. Let me say, it's only at the moment, perhaps in the future it'll be done with gas and no water. Uh, it used to be done with a cocktail of chemicals to make the water uh, more uh, slippery. And nowadays it's not made with those sorts of chemicals anymore. It's pretty benign stuff. So it changes. Thank you, John. Uh, Danny uh, and Admiral Blair has just co-chaired a uh, national commission on this subject. How big a deal is this, this uh, American energy boom? It's a, it's a huge deal. Uh, it concerns both gas and oil. In oil, for instance, in the last, uh, last five years, the United States has increased its oil production using fracking. Uh, to, to the 3.5 million barrels per day. It's the largest increase in that time period ever in, in drilling. So that's big on oil. On, on natural gas, it has taken an entire uh, set of construction that was done in the last several years to be able to bring liquid natural gas into the United States, liquefied natural gas, because we were going to be running out of gas, and it has made that completely obsolete. So this is hundreds of billions of dollars worth of a big deal. Well, let me ask then, John, why didn't the industry see this coming? I remember, and probably some of you do too, that, I don't know, seven years ago we were reading about shortages and so forth. We weren't reading about this extraordinary uh, boom in U.S. energy. Why, why didn't the industry experts Indeed, see it coming? Uh, I, when I was running BP, I was very disappointed that we lost a case, I think, which eventually went to the Supreme Court. Uh, to build an a, a import terminal for liquefied natural gas on the Delaware River. Uh, I was delighted about the, uh, about the outcome of that case in, in retrospect, I'd say. <laughs> uh, I think almost every pundit uh, around said uh, the U.S. had to import a lot of natural gas because it was running out, and principally it was running out because the new areas where hydrocarbons were found the deep water Gulf of Mexico, for good technical reasons, doesn't have much gas involved with the oil. So, so oil was doing okay, 
but there was no gas. So uh, everyone looked at the day, and they, I think, noted w what Mr. George Mitchell was, uh, was doing with hydraulic fracking. A and being a lot of engineers, basically <coughs> said, well, we'll believe it when we see it, a and step by step, because it all looked fairly risky. So conservatism set in, a and people said, well, really, we better ensure the future by importing gas. Now, this is not the first time the energy industry, I think I'm qualified to say this, has made a bit of a mess at uh, forecasting the future. Uh, the recent ones were, of course, importing natural gas, which is no longer needed. Uh, the, uh, the one just before that was peak oil. Uh, recall, we were going to run out of oil. Uh, I don't think we're going to do that either. Uh, and then uh, there were plenty of other similar uh, themes which became fashionable, but actually the level of prediction, the quality of forecasting, very poor. Uh, and I think it is probably to do with the innate conservatism. Uh, I think we should remember that perhaps we are going in the other direction now, but who knows. Yeah, it does make one cautious about the forecast we read today, given what you've just said. Well, I think if we were to base very important foreign policy on single point forecasts, we'd be making a very bad mistake. Good. Danny, why did it happen here, since I read that lots of countries, and we'll get into this in a bit, uh, have uh, the uh, capacity to develop shale, gas, and oil. Why did it happen here? I think it was a combination, one, of George Mitchell's uh, personal <coughs> persistence, the clear demand in the United States for gas, and, uh, but also there's some technical, uh, there are some technical uh, capabilities. And the, the gas people talk about the below the ground and the above the ground assets. Below the ground, you're right, lots of, lots of countries have tight gas and tight, tight oil, but above the ground, you need the right kind of companies. You need pipelines to be able to get the gas out if it's, if it's gas you're talk, talking about. You need the right regulatory structure. You need the right legal structure as to who owns the, who owns the, uh, the, the gas and oil itself below, uh, below a property owner on the, on the surface. And these things existed in the United States. Uh, they, uh, it remains to be seen whether they will be developed in other countries so that they can replicate what's been done here. Where else is it, uh, John, and how likely is it, or chime in here too, Let me just but how likely is it also that other countries will replicate what we're doing in this regard? I think one of the interesting things about the, the U.S. Uh, revolution in this area is it was conducted not by Exxon or BP or Shell or Chevron, but by a lot of companies, perhaps some of you may know the names, but most people wouldn't. Very small companies indeed. And the reason for that is that they had local skills. They had local skills <coughs> and local relationship skills uh, embodied in uh, a set of people called landmen. These are local negotiators, uh, all of whom were probably laid off by the big companies when the big companies <laughs> thought that there were better things to do. So local is very important. I also agree that there are tremendous incentives for local owners to assist in development because they take a direct economic interest in the success of the development. Now, uh, in the rest of the world, there's a lot of shale, which is very prospective. I personally am involved with uh, a lot of that through a company I chair uh, with tremendous prospectivity for the future. The same technology can be applied. But there are a couple of things to remember. The first is under the ground, uh, all shales are different. One size does not fit all, and it's, you have to spend time making it work. And secondly, above ground, all the circumstances are different. So uh, a crowded island like the UK is not the same as the wide open spaces in North Dakota, just not. Uh, and uh, it's been at development for a very long time. So the technology above ground has to change as well. So rather than drilling a forest of wells, you know, one at a time over wide open spaces, you have to drill them all from one little space. 
So preserving the above ground and keep uh, as well as thinking about the below ground will make things happen. Finally, you need to get incentives in place and history's uh, dealt a different hand depending on where you are. Uh, but I think most people realize that uh, you have to spread around uh, the benefits of any development in order to align a constituency. And so that sort of activity is going to happen in a variety of parts of the world, but it will take time. But there's plenty of potential, and there's plenty of need for that potential. I was in Oxfordshire over the weekend and talking with uh, my English friends about this who were quite skeptical that the political will would uh, be present in order to do it in England for the reasons that you mentioned, or in Britain as a whole. Are you pessimistic about that? Uh, no, because I'm a businessman and I'm never pessimistic. <laughs> uh, I think if you are, then you get nothing done at all. Uh, I think that, uh, look, at the moment, the uh, UK imports a lot of its own of its <clears throat> gas. It is actually importing the gas. The balance of payments on the energy account is huge. Uh, that money is going not only to Russia and uh, Norway, but also to Gata. Uh, and actually, wouldn't it be good if we could do our own thing? And I think people understand that. Where they are concerned, and here's the, the good news and the bad news about the US. The good news about the US is it's opened up this great potential for the world. The bad news is that in amongst all the people who've done it very well, there are also some bad stories of people doing bad things in the US. And I think it's really true to say that good news always stays at home and bad news travels fast elsewhere. So the bad news has traveled. And so we are, I think, at the point in Europe, generally, of needing to level set, reset the information base in an independent way. No one's going to believe me, because I've got a vested interest. Uh, but they might believe other people who could say, we can do this safely and securely. Again, a picture of uh, North Dakota, the Wilson Basin, and all that sort of area is not the same as you would see in Europe. Quite simply, you couldn't do it. A very different approach. The regulatory base, and I mean all great things need good regulation, uh, the regulatory base is uh, very good, and I think it's learned from the US. So let's see if the combination of all those things, uh, and I would say that all the political parties are behind it, but that may not be uh, as good as it sounds. Uh, I've read that uh, Ukraine, which is very much in the news these days for other reasons, Poland, China all have a lot of yep. shale. Would you expect those countries to proceed along the lines uh, that the U.S. has done? And if so, what's that timeline look so like? So I would, uh, well, obviously, first in, South, in, in, the, in, the, in the Western Hemisphere, places like Mexico uh, and uh, Argentina have enormously potential resources. And I would expect, certainly, Mexico with the opening uh, to spend, uh, to make quite a lot of effort to open that. And I think it'd be very, very good for everybody. It will add a further diversified source. I think in Europe, people will pursue it. Russia actually has a lot of shale potential itself, probably as much as anybody. Uh, Ukraine does, uh, uh, Poland does, they all do. Uh, I think uh, right now to say that Ukraine will provide a stable source of gas in this area would be the wrong place to focus on, <laughs> I think. Uh, but there's a lot of places in Europe uh, which can do this, and indeed should do this. It will, for Europe as a whole, add one more source of supply. And, and I think, you know, it sounds too simplistic, but as long as they're all economic, then the more sources of supply you've got, the better off you are. Uh, and I think that rule should never be forgotten. Uh, Denny, how big a deal is this with the U.S. economy? Uh, you, in general, said it's billions. I think I read a McKinsey report saying it would add more than 2% to the U.S. GDP over the next 10 years. Uh, and I think I remember reading a million and a half jobs would be created, uh, high-paying jobs. But is that, 
Is that the conventional wisdom now that it is going to have a big, a big impact on the U.S. economy? Those, those figures are, are about right. Uh, GDP is in the, in the one to two percent. Uh, there's a big effect on uh, balance of payments right now, uh, or as recently as a couple of years ago, half of our overall, uh, uh, overall balance of payments uh, deficit every year was due to payments for petroleum overseas on the order of 300 billion a year, and that comes down rapidly, of course, when, you, when you're uh, dr drilling it here. There are jobs within the, within the industry itself uh, of that scale, and then, of course, the availability of cheaper um, uh, petrochemical feeds into chemical and other industries uh, lowers prices, adds jobs, makes, makes more competitive, and then there are all of the spinoff uh, jobs from that. So it's really... Uh, it's really a tremendous, uh, uh, a tremendous benefit to the to the U.S. U.S. economy, which we're seeing um, uh, more and more every year. Uh, John, you mentioned bad actors uh, a minute ago. Um, how much should we worry about the environmental effects of this? Because there are critics of it who worry about uh, those effects. Well, I, I think first of all, with with almost anything that looks at uh, resources, resource development, you should always worry about the environment. So whether that's coal, uh, oil, gas, uranium, uh, it, they're all bad and they're all good. And they're transformed from bad to good through good regulation and good practice and good science. Uh, and I think the same is true here. I mean, it's very much uh, a matter of getting the best practice in the right places. but done badly. Uh, you know, we could release a lot of methane into the atmosphere. That's not good. It shouldn't happen because operators know how to stop that happening. My personal experience in BP, we spent uh, years tightening up valves, thinking about different ways of doing things, saving a lot of money, and actually reducing the amount of methane going to the air to <coughs> very small amounts. It's about protecting water tables. So when you drill wells through a water table, you have to make sure you insulate the pipe from the water table. It's well-known technology, costs a bit. So if you don't spend the money, you may make a mistake. Uh, it's a few things like that. So keeping, uh, having good regulation that stops free loaders, uh, you know, people taking a free ride on good practice is important. But actually, it's very clear you can do this with minimal impact on the environment, and what's more, you're producing gas, and sometimes oil, but, but gas, which is lighter hydrocarbon, and it's better for, under all circumstances, it burns very efficiently, far better than coal as a source of energy or electricity. And I, I, would, I would just add, Bob, based on, you know, in the armed forces where I spent about 35 years, we carry a lot of really dangerous stuff around in small spaces mm -hmm. all the time, and <laughs> we have extraordinary procedures in order to make sure we can do that, do that safely, and that when explosions happen, they're ones we cause on other ships rather than uh, ones that happen on our own ships. And, and uh, the, the keys to it are independence of your, of your regulators, the qualification of your, of your regulators, and the just dogged following through on the checklists uh, con continually at, as you go. There's yeah. no magic to it. And every time we see a, a, uh, a uh, environmental damage caused by, uh, caused by resource uh, extraction and you go do the investigation, it turns out that you just weren't following the rules. So we, we've, got to be, we've got to be hard on it. And it, it, you've got to put the resources and, and uh, set up the right structures for it. But it can be done. And we do have uh -huh. to come back, I think, to have a proper debate about what's information and what is pure, uh, made up, right. made up right. activity. I mean, a lot of the stuff about, uh, you know, gas coming out of uh, pipes in kitchens and catching fire. I think, you know, the Colorado, state of Colorado has clearly demonstrated this is not on the basis of shale gas, it's to do with biogenic gas. I mean, it's basically things rotting in the water system. So uh, it's getting the information right here and having a debate and saying, and I think the industry all has to say again, you know, we, are, we, we agree, we want regulation, we want good regulation, we want independent supervision, 
and we want to be held to account. Uh, a question I think will affect everyone in the audience uh, in a direct way. What is this uh, oil boom in particular going to do to the price of oil? And all of you can reach for your cell phones to call your brokers here about whatever he has to say. So I can take I a shot at that. We had, when in this study, we basically took four, four different scenarios. Uh, and when you look at the <coughs> variables within the, in the scenarios, uh, and we'll roll the dice, choose which one will be, which one, one will be uh, more important. But uh, the secular trend is that we, we need on the planet more energy, <laughs> primarily driven by, uh, by developments in China and in, uh, and in India and in other de developing, developing countries. And the balance between that, that demand and the price of the fuels that produce it, uh, traditional wells are fairly cheap. The deep water drilling, fracking, and so on is much, is much more expensive. That will sort of play out in that, in that area. So uh, I, I, I w if I were to make a, a bet on a price, I would hedge it heavily. But you're not willing to name a number? <laughs> oh, Maybe we can get- 80 John. to $120 a barrel. <laughs> So John, what do you think, John? Well, I spent 45 years trying to avoid this question, <laughs> uh, uh, or the answer to the question. And I don't think I'm going to change too much. Uh, I think you know what, what's interesting is every time you think something's going to happen, of course, un unintended, unexpected events happen. So today, <clears throat> in the world, there's quite a lot of oil which is shut in as a result of issues to do with various countries in the world. Uh, and you as members of CFR are well aware of many of those issues. So there's sort of three million barrels just shut in because of issues to do with governance and, and war and conflict. And there's probably a bit more available which is managed outside the system. So uh, it looks like there's a lot of oil around and so in theory it should have reduced the price. In practice it hasn't. Uh, and then there's a limit to amount the amount the price might drop because of the immediate needs of many countries that just produce hydrocarbons as their primary source of economic activity and the rate of expenditure. So the so-called break-even number is quite high for many countries, including Russia, who, who spend a lot of the money that they make by exporting hydrocarbons. So with one thing and another, the best forecast is kind of today's price. You know, you say, well, I can't, there's so many things that will change. I mean, I do think, for example, the world will get better and more efficient at using energy. But whether that efficiency will be used by re to reduce the amount they use or will simply uh, take the efficiency and spend it elsewhere, you know, rather than have a one for each, have two, uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, whether there's uh, a moment in the world where there's no conflict, uh, that also remains to be seen. I've not seen that recently. Uh, uh, and whether there are more discoveries to be made, which makes even more oil available in the world, that also remains to be seen. It's very important just to remember proportions. The most important source of oil in the United States is the deep water Gulf of Mexico, not shale oil. And that is to be remembered. And it looks like that's going to be the case for quite a long time. So everything counts here. We focus on one thing, but actually a lot happens. So I would always prompt for, you know, look at, the, uh, look at today's price and say, around today's price, not a bad number, <laughs> at least for the short term. You see uh, uh, the caution on the part, uh, probably uh, uh, quite thoughtful caution on the part of our uh, colleagues here. If you look at the literature, uh, there's really a very wide spectrum of projections. Um, there are, I would say, uh, if not the majority, at least a substantial number of the serious studies uh, write about $70 a barrel oil, 70 to 80, but there are so many imponderables here, as, as Denny and John have said. Uh, Danny, w w the United States is clearly a big winner in this technology. Are there losers out in the world? As uh, John said, if Russia uh, has to deal with oil at $70 a barrel, this is a different 
uh, set of Russian uh, problems than they have now. Do you, uh, one thinks of the Saudis, mm -hmm. Venezuelans, the Iranians. Um, are, are there losers out there in, uh, the, among the oil producers and are there winners uh, as you look forward? I don't, I don't think the big secular trends are sorting out, uh, are sorting out losers in uh, hydrocarbon uh, producers. Uh, this this, um, this uh, political floor on oil for countries that are heavily hydrocarbon uh, dependent uh, certainly does have, have, an, have an effect. Uh, but the, um, the 70 or $80 a, a barrel projections that you see are pretty optimistic. Uh, they're based on being able to produce a, a lot of that uh, conventional, relatively inexpensive oil. That's almost all OPEC, Middle East and North Africa producers. Uh, it, it depends heavily on Iraq coming online in a pretty big way and, and somebody who forecasts a, uh, a peaceful Iraq in the, f in the future has taken quite a, uh, quite a, ch quite a chance. Uh, so I, I think that the uh, losers, um, I, I think there's sort of a self-regulating system there in that as the, as the price goes down, the, uh, the uh, companies who are the, or the countries that are the swing producers, which are primarily in the Middle East and North Africa, will do what they've done in the past, is try to ratchet down on their variable ability to produce it in order to keep the price at what they need in order to uh, make make uh, make their federal budgets. So it's hard to see a scenario really of tremendous supply, restrained demand, price going down with the sort of uh, political floors on on oil that we see by the national oil companies and the con countries that depend on it. And what about then OPEC? Is OPEC affected at well, all I, over the long term by <coughs> this th these developments? Uh, well, let me, alongside them, if I may, I want to come to Dennis. Uh, to Please me, do. the most important thing actually is, is uh, natural gas. If you think about the US situation with natural gas, natural gas for, for a unit of energy is 75% cheaper than uh, the energy which comes out of oil. So it's a 75% discount. And uh, this is dramatic. So anyone who is dependent on expensive gas that is priced on the same basis as oil is actually spending three times as much as it could do as, as the US does for a piece of gas. And since gas is the fundamental uh, driver for uh, electricity and for uh, petrochemicals and all these sorts of things, it's a very big disadvantage not to have domestic supplies that are big enough to compete, to allow gas to compete with itself, to, to decouple it from the price of oil. So I say that because I don't know quite how that will work out in the long term. But right now it's given a huge advantage. It's the gas that gives the manufacturing and industrial base this huge advantage uh, that is, in my view, affecting Europe hugely. And at the moment, it is being disadvantaged by the cost of its uh, energy. As to OPEC, OPEC is one of those things which, uh, I mean, everyone's written the obituary of OPEC uh, more often uh, than I can remember. Every wishful thinking says that we'd like it to go away. Uh, and indeed, one of the founder members is about to decouple, so Mexico is about to decouple its uh, industry from apparent state control. So uh, I, I, I think the, the main point is that OPEC is uh, not, uh, not a, a, a well-oiled machine, to coin a phrase, but it certainly responds when uh, <coughs> things get tough for people whose livelihood <coughs> is based on oil. And from time to time, it comes into the frame to say, enough's enough. Uh, and uh, that's very much in the hands of Saudi Arabia, primarily, uh, and a couple of other fellow travelers. <laughs> but I think uh, it would be wrong to say it's dead. It's still, it hasn't actually been in use for some time. Danny, let me ask you uh, a final question, and then we'll ask our colleagues to chime in. 
Uh, I've uh, read some commentary that suggests that with uh, less or no American dependence on energy from the Middle East, retrenchment is possible, advisable even, from there. What's your feeling about that? The, um, the study that we, that we conducted that I referred to addressed that exact, exact <laughs> question, and the answer is that although uh, greatly increased U.S. domestic production of oil uh, gives us more options, it doesn't give us that, that option. The oil market is still an international market. Uh, the United States transportation sector is still uh, some 90 percent dependent uh, on that, so if there's a supply interruption and a price spike, in oil around the world, it, it affects the US, uh, U.S. economy. We saw, for example, in uh, 2011 when Libya, Libya's oil production went off the market. It's only a little over a million barrels per day, but that basically stalled the U.S. Uh, recovery from the 2008-2009 recession that was going on at that time, and we plateaued for about a year until um, in an ag agreement uh, to release strategic petroleum reserves and a partial uh, resumption of, uh, of uh, production in other areas, uh, the price came down and we, and we got back on track. So the United States has opportunities, uh, but, in, but until we can change the basis of the transportation sector from oil to natural gas and electricity, which in turn is based on a variety of uh, sources, including, including natural gas, we will be subject to uh, the international oil market and the swing producers uh, will be in the Middle East, primarily Saudi Arabia, other, other countries, so we'll have to pay attention to, to, to what's there. So it's, it's good news, but it does not enable us to uh, walk away from uh, that area of the, uh, of the, of the world. Uh, but, there are, but there are lots of things we, we can do to make our economy less susceptible in the middle, medium term, and then over the long term, uh, we should change the basis of our transportation sector away from oil, and then we are truly um, then we are truly uh, secure in that area. I suppose we all uh, 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 think about the other issues having to do with the Middle East, uh, the uh, terrorism, uh, much of which emanates from there, nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. state of Israel, and other reasons uh, the United States uh, should stay involved. I want to now turn to you all uh, and to invite uh, members to join our conversation. Uh, just to remind you, this meeting is on the record. Uh, wait for the microphone. Speak directly into it if you would. Please stand, state your name and uh, affiliation, and if you could actually ask a question, we'd all be grateful, and perhaps only one. So uh, who? Right back here, we'll start here, this gentleman, and then we'll just go back and forth around the room. Sir. <clears throat> Stephen Blank, given the deeply integrated nature of the North American energy industry, shouldn't we really begin looking at these issues that you've raised in this volume in a North American perspective? Who, Dan, no, did you want I, I to mean, think? Yes. Uh, we, the, the, in fact, the entire, the entire energy market is, uh, is interconnected worldwide, much less within this uh, country where we can run pipelines back and uh, back, back and forth, and and uh, in fact, the U.S. and Canadian uh, U.S. and Canadian uh, hydrocarbon uh, resources are are quite uh, quite interconnected. Uh, whether they will be a bit more interconnected with a large controversial pipeline uh, coming down, we will we will see. I think the I think the uh, probably the bigger change would be with Mexico, and whether these changes in the governance of uh, of the Mexican uh, of the Mexican National Oil Company will, in fact, make a difference in terms of accepting uh, accepting other North American uh, partners in order to do mechanical fracturing or the other the other uh, the, the other techniques. Uh, whether the financial and uh, technical uh, cooperation there can, in fact, bring um, Mexico into a, a bigger role in the North American system. Over yeah, here, if, please. If, if I may, uh, John, I go ahead. Then we'll I think your question is the question that almost every government in the world is being asked, and no one's able to answer it, which is uh, what energy policy and strategy do you have? And the answer I think most people would say is we really want lots of choice. 
Uh, and I think that probably is about the beginning and end of it. We want lots of choice, and then we either, and fill in the gap, we either want to do it reducing uh, carbon dioxide emissions, or we don't care about them. So uh, other than that, there are very few things, and we want it as cheaply as possible. So it seems to me that uh, to cheaply as possible and secure as possible, you need uh, um, as much interconnection as possible around the world. The US is still heavily dependent on uh, imports of products that aren't made here and exports of products that are made here that aren't needed. Diesel, for example. Uh, it's ve uh, the US is very dependent on electricity, which comes from Canada, and indeed oil and gas from Canada. Uh, Europe is interconnected completely. But uh, I think we just need to understand that these interconnections will get more complicated, not simpler, and that we need to understand that how to make them work for the future. Right here. Yes. Carol Brookins, former USCD at the World Bank. Uh, I'd like to pick <coughs> up on something that Lord Brown raised, which was that with hydraulic fracturing, the enormous uses of water, which is another issue in the world today, and but that there, uh, but you indicated that there may be some opportunities in the future to use gas uh, to propel the sand as opposed to water. I understand, though, there is enormous work going on in the oil and gas industry on technologies for recycling that water, and I'm wondering if that's going to be one of the good effects of this uh, technological breakthrough, which will apply to other areas also, such as agricultural irrigation, as the oil and gas industry is able to better reuse and clean waters. Thank you. Indeed. I mean, the amount of water used is large, but I think it's rivaled by the amount of water used to water golf courses, <laughs> uh, which I think is a rather larger uh, user of water. So we need to get things into perspective here. Uh, and I think that, uh, and, and you may all have a different view of which you prefer, but uh, nonetheless, I think that is the case. So recycling is critical, uh, cleaning up and recycling, and then substitution. And I think the, the, the other one, the other area, of course, is the use of less water by uh, technologies which allow you to target the fracking into places more accurately. And over time, that's possible as well. So I think it, while it's an important uh, consideration and should be dealt with responsibly, I do not believe it is a constraint if handled properly. Right back here. Yes. Thank you. Nisabwa of Pace University. You mentioned, Mr. Brown, that the energy content of natural gas is about 25% of that of oil. Given the law of economic arbitrage, how does that persist? What are the costs of arbitrage, and what is the long-term outlook for that discrepancy? Well, of Thank course, you. two things. We, first, we have to, I think everyone has to believe that will the relative pricing, and it's the price per BTU, price per unit of energy, will it, will it last? And people are always very uncertain about that. Uh, so they're not prepared to commit to this gap lasting for a very long time. But even if they are, then a lot has to happen to infrastructure. You can wish to have natural gas vehicles all over the place, but the time it takes to get that to happen is very long. So people are, will always worry about the capital expenditure uh, required to make these changes. Some of that is happening. Some has actually happened over the long distance past. But I think the arbitrage exists for quite a long time uh, because the, ma the markets for the use of the different products are so separated. And that, I think, is what's happening. Uh, so I think it will last for some time. The question, I think, in the rest of the world is why, is, why are the markets so linked uh, that oil and gas, for example, are priced on the same formula, but again, they're actually used in different markets. They used to be used in the same one. Both used to, in the end, be put so-called under the boiler to, to make electricity. But that doesn't happen anymore. So that's a question people are asking in places like Europe and Japan. Uh, same thing there, about why should we price gas 
on the same basis as oil. Right here, down front. Thank you. Uh, my Could name is Seyfi. Seyfi. Okay. Very good. My name is Seyfi Gosemi. Uh, I'm with Safe and also uh, Rockwood Holdings. Uh, it's obviously the stated policy of the U.S. government that uh, we are not going to allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon. In case the current negotiations fail, it seems that the only option would be a military option. Can you educate us that in such an event, what should we be prepared for? What do you think will happen? And as a businessman, obviously, what should we explain? Is it a short-term period? Can we keep the Strait of Hormuz open? And things like that. Thank you. Is this the pr uh, price of oil question? Is that what you have in mind? Uh, I'm talking about price of oil, supply, and also the duration. Is this something that can be contained in a month, or would it be a six-month event? Jimmy. Well, the military situation is that uh, a naval coalition led by the United States could handle whatever Iran could do to try to close that strait within a matter of a few weeks and could physically uh, keep it uh, keep it open. Uh, if you look at the history of events like that, there, uh, as the political temperature heats up, there's a spike in oil because people, a lot of uncertainty, people fear what might, uh, what might uh, happen uh, then, uh, as happened in the late 80s and so on, when it's, it's clear that the, um, the rest of the world that depends on, on uh, oil coming through the Strait of Hormuz can, in fact, uh, keep it relatively safe. Insurance rates come down, price comes back, comes back down. I think we would see, I would, I think we would see that uh, again. Uh, I think that, um, I think that the scenarios that uh, that emin that come out of the Middle East that really keep the price high are these series of events, reactions, and other events which, which give a sort of an uncertainty to the whole s situation there, which is, which is interconnected. What happens in Syria is connected to what happens in Iraq, is connected to what happens in Iran, uh, is connected to what happens across, across the Gulf. And it's, I think it's sort of the frequency and the size of the, these individual uh, military political events in that part of the country that sort of keeps the, the price high and spiking that would it would be of most concern over the long term. But if you look at any individual event, there are countervailing forces that come to bear pretty quickly to take care of it. But then there's another one, and another one, and another one. Uh, so uh, I, I think, uh, and, and those are all almost impossible to uh, almost impossible to predict. And that is where the world's, uh, you know, roughly 15 percent of, the, of the, the world's oil comes from, and virtually all of its uh, backup supply, its uh, stability supply. Over here. Uh, Christopher Dickey with the Daily Beast. Uh, could we come back to Ukraine for a minute? Ukraine supposedly has huge reserves of shale gas. Poland s was supposed to have had huge reserves, but it seems they didn't pan out. I think the estimates went from 44 down to 9 trillion cubic feet in a year. Is there any hope that Ukraine can gain some kind of energy independence from Russia uh, in the near future? And how do you see the whole Ukraine dynamic playing, all, playing out with Europe? If we're talking about sanctions against Russia because of what's been happening, is there any prayer that Europe can wean itself off of Russian gas anytime in the near future? Thank you. Uh, let me. I think we should take this together. Let me, uh, let me start, I think, with uh, first uh, resources. Uh, Ukraine clearly has uh, shale sh potential shale gas, uh, not been uh, tested, but uh, it, it, it seems from most analysis that it's got uh, a significant resource. Poland has a resource. It's unclear quite what size it is. And I think it would be a little... Um, a little wrong to write off uh, the scale of Poland on the basis of, I think, uh, 10 wells in total, I think, in the entire country. It's a little bit too much of a reaction. I don't know what the answer will be, 
But right now I'd say, keep an open mind, there may be something there. Ukraine, of course, today, uh, the worry about Ukraine is that it is, uh, of course, it takes a lot of gas from uh, Russia, and Russia can um, change the price of that uh, reasonably easily. It is so-called sold at a, an apparent discount to the Ukraine at the moment, whatever that means. Uh, but Ukraine also is the conduit uh, for gas to parts of Europe. Uh, that is uh, much less than it used to be because of other pipelines, North Stream, for example, uh, being another one which has taken away uh, the dependence of one bottleneck uh, for Europe to have. So that's, I think, the facts. I think the other fact is that for the principal part of Europe, uh, for, for, as it will I call, it's not mainland Europe, but, the, but Europe as we know it has not had a gas interruption resulting from uh, Russian action. The only places I think is the case is Georgia uh, and the Ukraine. But as to the rest of uh, Europe, I think since 1975, and I'm not trying to be an ap apologist, uh, I think there's been no uh, interruption in gas supply. So the question you have to ask yourself is, w will there be one, uh, given this long track record over many different types of regime, indeed? So thirdly, uh, you, the Europe has to, I believe, open up its uh, shale gas resources. Uh, they could be very significant. They will take time. We're dealing with decade plus time. But uh, you know, a decade's always a decade, whether you delay another year or not. Uh, and so you have to start to get to the end. So I think developing European shale gas is very, very important. Europe's also developed a large number of import terminals for LNG, uh, which has diversified its sources. And it still has a lot of domestic and indigenous uh, natural gas, not, not least in Norway, uh, for example. So the diversification is taking place in one way or another. I think it must not stop. We should continue to diversify sources, uh, not least because it will add uh, to a retention of, uh, a re retention of cur a currency. I mean, the balance of payments will be uh, satisfactory. And also it potentially, if there's enough gas, uh, can help the price along. I, I think that that's quite comprehensive, but the, there's, just, there's one other um, aspect of diversity which is important, not just where you get uh, the different types of gas or oil from, but it's the diversity of, of how you can use energy sources for its different purposes within the, within the country. Uh, right now, the U.S. transportation sector, as I mentioned, is 90 percent dependent on, on oil, refined, refined petroleum. Diversity within that mix of uh, the transportation sector would be good in the United States as it would be good in any other industrialized country. So that if, uh, if there's, because we can't predict the future, because uh, things may get, get tight in one sector or in one, or in one uh, type of petroleum, you want to have as many different ways to work around that as, as, you, as you can. And uh, Europe has been working to reduce its, its uh, dependence on, uh, on Russian gas for a long time. It can also uh, uh, look at other ways to reduce its dependence on, on gas for, one, for heating in houses, which is where it has the greatest effect. And so this sort of internal diversity of energy use as well as external uh, diversity of energy sources is really the only key for an individual country or a region to be able to be proof against some of these uh, political or economic events that uh, tend to really cause big problems. I think the, 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 the kernel, Christopher, is that it's unlikely that shale gas in Ukraine is going to have any effect on the current crisis or the one that follows that or the one that follows that, although in the long term, yeah. as John and Danny have said, it might substantially add to uh, Ukraine's capacity to defend itself over time. We'll go right, let me go back in the furthest one back um, Yes, sir, exactly. Lester Wiggler, Morgan Stanley. Do either of you see any meaningful role for any of the green alternatives like solar or wind generation 
uh, to play a major role in providing energy? And would it be sufficient without the major subsidization which it is currently receiving? Well, it's, um, I think most people, I think it's worth just looking at the global data. Uh, as far as the world's concerned, of course, more uh, electricity is produced from renewable energy right now than it is from nuclear energy in the whole world. So it is quite big already, very important. Sustainable production of, uh, of uh, electricity from renewable energy requires renewable energy to get cheaper. Uh, and that's uh, what has to happen. Uh, over the last five years, uh, the price of electricity from solar has gone down by about 50%, and uh, from wind between 10 and 20, however you calculate it. And there's absolutely no reason why that wouldn't happen again. Uh, in fact, it would be amazing if it didn't, uh, given the normal trends in, in engineering. So you'd expect uh, renewable energy to get cheaper over time. Uh, we have to invest in the technology. And you'd expect uh, different countries to have different levels of subsidy or not subsidy, depending on its cost and their sense of security and so forth. I'll give you a little example. I mean, in Chile, for example, uh, their alternative cost of energy is importing LNG from Brunei, right across the Pacific Ocean. So, and they've got a lot of wind, they've got a lot of solar. So it's obviously very beneficial. But I think putting uh, a wind turbines where the wind hardly ever blows, uh, or you put solar panels where the sun hardly ever shines, and you rely on subsidies to make up the difference, is, I think, not a good idea. In the end, you've got to get the resources right. And that's where I think subsidies have been uh, uh, really t taken not for what they should be. So I, I think it's going to be, uh, it's here to stay. And I think it will become a bigger proportion of uh, the world energy mix. From my point of view, a good thing. And I think it can be done. And in my own experience, since I run a, a, renew a very large renewable energy fund, the world's largest, I can tell you that you can do it and make it profitable. I would only add that um, if, when you think about the role of government in, uh, the larger role of government in the energy sector, we've talked about regulation, extremely important to make sure it's done, done safely. We, uh, we just talked about uh, the um, renew renewable energies in, in terms of both security and in terms of the environment. But I, I do think that there is a stronger government role available uh, for security and in ensuring this diversity of supplies that we, uh, that we talked about. To simply say that the market will, will handle it is, is going to lead to bad results. It has to be smart uh, action by the, by the government. Uh, but if you allow uh, the market, as far as we can see it, to determine your uh, gas and petroleum uh, import, uh, import picture, you will leave tremendous national mm -hmm. security vulnerabilities and economic vulnerabilities. So I, I think we need to look at the whole picture, not just at uh, whether we can increase renewables uh, at a, an affordable cost. Right here, sir. Gerald Pollack. My question concerns the transportation sector and the future that you see for the all-electric car. I see that Mercedes and BMW is now producing an electric car. Nissan, uh, has one also, and of course there's the Tesla. Do you see that this has a bright future? And uh, is it going to make much difference in the energy balance, considering that electricity has to be generated in some fashion? Yes, I think it would make a, uh, would make a tremendous difference. Uh, the price of energy has uh, basically gone down in recent years, unlike the price of uh, oil, which, which fuels our, our sector. And with natural gas and abundant U.S. supplies, the price of energy in the United States will continue to be uh, down. So there's an economic uh, argument in, in that sense. The, the problems with electric, electric vehicles are well, well known, price and range. Uh, both of those have to do with batteries. About half the price of an electric car is in the batteries. The batteries uh, now are limited in their range. Range depends on infrastructure, where the, fueling po where the recharging points are, how fast they, uh, how fast they can or re recharge the car, and you can get back on the uh, you can get back on the road. Uh, all of these are manageable 
man manageable problems. We're not talking about going to the moon here. Uh, we are talking about setting up the structures right in order to, uh, in order to get it there. And the benefits are, are just tremendous. Uh, if you look at from 2001 to, say, 2012, uh, the money that was uh, returned to the American taxpayer, to the average family, in terms of tax rebates, in payroll taxes, and so on, was exactly matched by the amount of money that Ameri that same American family had to pay for the gas overseas. In addition, the price spikes in oil have kicked our economy off. So the benefits are, tr are tremendous if we can get off of oil as the 90% fueler of our uh, transportation ve vehicles. And I would just add that in addition, to, in addition to electrical vehicles, which are really the answer for light trucks and, and cars, for the uh, fleet vehicles, buses in cities like New York, and for the 18-wheelers that uh, are, are, on the, uh, are on, the, on the interstates, uh, either uh, liquid natural gas or compressed natural gas itself can be a, can be a good fuel. So we can, we can do this, uh, and, uh, and the, the benefits to uh, the country, both from a national security point of view and from an economic point of view, uh, are very, very compelling. I, I, if I may, I, we've, I've been involved in, in several uh, ventures in this area, and, and I think the, the problem is this, that of course most people don't buy a Mercedes, and they don't buy a BMW, and they don't buy a Tesla. What they really want is a very cheap uh, small car, which is not too small, uh, that uh, will work uh, under all circumstances and all places. I'm always amazed at the piece of technology called an automobile. You basically buy, turn it on, and it works. And you have to, don't have to set it up in any way. So getting to that point, cheap, affordable, reliable, uh, always ready, it is going to take some time, I think. And I, it's unclear to me whether we'll actually get there uh, with electric cars or whether we'll get there with uh, gas cars or whether the internal combustion engine will get so efficient that we'll use only a fraction of the uh, gasoline that we use today to drive a car. I think there'll be a mix, but right now I'm, I'm not sure that what the Tesla's doing, which is great, is an indicator of the future. Uh, I'm afraid we're near the end here, so perhaps one more question and then uh, I'd, I'm way in the back. I'm sorry, but we haven't heard from this uh, quadrant over here, so way in the back. Thank you very much. Christine Bader, uh, formerly of VP, author of a forthcoming book about my time there. I, I'm hoping you all can uh, talk a little bit more about the social and environmental risks. We've mentioned smart regulation. We've mentioned hiring locally, getting good information out there. Could we talk a little bit more about what does smart regulation look like and internally from the corporate perspective, what do companies need to do to perhaps, per, perhaps to better integrate some of those considerations into how they go about their business? Uh, big question, two minutes. So uh, whoever wants to take that on. Uh, well, I think the, it seems to me the best regulation, of course, is one which is not written by industry, but one which is informed by industry practice, science and engineering, and then uh, the, the general public. So it takes time to get right. And I think it all has to be around economic trade-offs as well. There are no absolutes here. Uh, something, since you've mentioned your book, I'll mention mine, uh, <laughs> since, uh, which I, I talk about in my book, The Seven Elements, which I think starts from a very simple viewpoint, in my experience, right across the, uh, the mining and uh, petroleum uh, space, is that you know, everything is bad, uh, and everything is good. What stacks the deck is the ability to contain it through great regulation. And there's no other choice, of course, available to us. I, I would just add that um, based, on, based on my experience, we, pen, we spend too much time thinking about the, the regulations as they're written and published in the Federal Register and commented on. And, and uh, to my mind, the key to good regulation is good, good regulators. And, that means that these cannot be the cast-offs from the industry who couldn't get a job on the rig, and therefore they're hired to inspect their cousins who did were smarter and did get the job. <laughs> uh, you have to, you have to have, you have to pay um, your regulators maybe off the civil service scale in order to get uh, really good ones. You have to have a continual retraining capability, and they have to have 
tough. If they walk into a mine and find something is bad, they bring it to a halt and say, I'll be back next week to see if you have it back up to snuff or not. You can't screw around with a $50,000 penalty and, and think that you're going to get a response. So I'd say the quality of the inspectors, which means training and, uh, and compensation, and I'd, I'd say really high teeth in the, in, the, in the tools that they are given in order to make sure that uh, best practices are being followed. Well, uh, I think we've reached the end. Uh, perhaps some of you are struck by the fact that we sit in this room often and walk away hearing disturbing, troubling, uh, and worse news. We actually had a session today where we heard a lot of optimistic news. And uh, I want to commend Lord Brown's book. I read it in preparing for uh, this session, and it's elegantly written and uh, a very creative, interesting read. And also uh, Admiral Blair's commission report, which uh, will tell you a lot more about this subject. So uh, uh, let's uh, thank them and thank you all for coming. <laughs>